Starlink is down for today. So I might be a little shaky. I might bounce in and out today. And so we will make do with what we have. Let me pull up on Facebook, make sure we are live and see how my connection is. As always, I'm very excited to introduce our this week guests, but even a little more excited. Not Whoops. <laughs> We are live on Facebook, apparently. Um, so Brianna Hamamoto, but Hardman also, <laughs> professionally Hamamoto. Um, and Sherry's saying she's having thunderstorms. So yeah, you guys, the weather's a little crazy. Say hi if you're watching from Facebook. Make sure we, our sound is cool. And then I'm... Um, Anybody else? Oh, I forgot to put the link in, you guys, didn't I? Let me do that for you. Let me make sure. Well, maybe it's too late. Darn it. So cool. You guys, if um, it's the same Zoom link as it always is. Hi, Amy. And so I apologize. I didn't write it in to the live but debbie's on so hopefully it will travel all right so today we have brianna hamamoto i always want to call you your mom's name <laughs> oh my gosh i'm like every time i say your name i'm like it's not desiree and so <laughs> i've known brianna since she was fairly young i think i don't know maybe 14 yeah, I must have been 14 or 15 because you were you're reading my heart horse. So yeah. yeah. And you were <laughs> ballerina at the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and now she's a, a full-fledged veterinarian, UC Davis graduate, who is the lead trainer for veterinarians in emergency response in the state of California, correct? Oh yeah. I mean, I'm I'm a part of a team. So we're we're a smaller team here in California. Um that is just uh, forming, we just got a, there's a whole website on it, uh, cvet at .ucdavis.edu. Um, and you can find out more about us. But yeah, we're we're a team of of uh, individuals that are all dedicated to animal disaster response. So it's pretty awesome. And it's <laughs> not just horses, even though you're kind of focused on horses, you do a little of everything, correct? Yeah, I, my, my primary focus is a uh, large animal, but as whatever is out there, you know, you never really know what you're going to encounter in these situations. So if there's a small animal need, you betcha we'll be over there too. And, and our um, operations is an incredible small animal emergency veterinarian. So um, we have a really amazing team. So is your team based out of UC Davis? Mm -hmm. We are. So is that um, would be your office? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All of our offices are over at UC Davis. We're part of the One Health Institute, um, which is a part of the School of Veterinary Medicine. Excellent. Very mm -hmm. nice. Congratulations. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> How do you get involved in emergency response? The last time I had talked to you, you were in research. Yeah. Yeah. So I had a really interesting path. <laughs> um, I did my undergraduate UC Davis um, and then applied for vet school and actually didn't get in. Um, they had just changed all the requirements to where it was not so much about volunteer hours anymore or like work hours and experience. And so I was coming into applications with, I don't know, like four or 5,000 hours of experience because I was living at the Center for Equine Health at the time as like a live-in technician. Um, and my grades were like not bad, but once they changed the admissions, it was not up to their standards of, of GPAs. So um, didn't get in the first time, the second time decided to leave it up to fate and applied for, um, a PhD program and vet school and got waitlisted for vet school and got into the PhD program. So I was like, all right, that's fine. Like fate says go research. So, um, I did three years of a PhD in pharmacology and toxicology under Dr. Heather Knitch, who is absolutely incredible. Also at UC Davis, um, working on pain management in horses. And then she was that mentor in my life that just kind of changed everything. And she walked into my office one day and she's like, you're applying for vet school this year. It's happening. You need to do this. <laughs> That's amazing. So That's so, Well, thank God, right? Yeah. <laughs> 
I did and uh, got in that year and, and I finished my PhD while I was in vet school with her help and her mentorship. Um, but my first year of vet school was the year that the campfire would happened. Um, so I wasn't totally aware of everything that UC Davis did in terms of emergency response. Um, I kind of was this like wide-eyed little freshman vet student and was like, I'm gonna go help the animals. And uh, we went, I was toward the end of the response and we were at the small animal shelter. They had the National Guard there. And I got to go in and help and just completely found my place in the world. Like it was just one of those moments where you're just like, oh, this is this is where I'm supposed to be. Um, so kind of with that experience, I, I responded to fires the next four years um, as a student and became a student leader my third year. So I was running, I was co-running one of the whole student side of the response. Um, under the mentorship of Dr. John Madigan, who is absolutely incredible as well. So, um, and then Dr. Claudia Saunders of Napa took me under her wing as well. So she took me into the Northern California Association of Equine Practitioners, who also has an emergency response team. <laughs> and I was a student leader for them as well. So they kind of saw my, my love and my passion for this area. Um, and also me just being like, how do I do this? Like, how do I make this a career? And they really fostered me up into what I am now. So um, got a, a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of experience. Um, the three years that I was really responding, 2020 was, I think we did three different fires that year. So that was a pretty life-changing year. Um, yeah, that was brutal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In the middle of COVID too, right? Like as much as COVID was, horrible for so many people it was a small blessing in disguise because I was able to stream my classes and go up to the fires and work the shelters after all my classes were done so I was zooming classes and working in the shelters at the same time that's awesome that's amazing <laughs> so it's crazy that California is so flammable mm -hmm. and why do you think that do you understand like the science behind why suddenly there are so many fires. Is it just crazy whack jobs? Are they mostly like arson or is it the <laughs> heat or is it the ozone or what is going you on know, here? I like now I we have fire season. Yeah, no, I think there's so many different aspects to it. Right. And I think there's so many people trying to answer this question because every year I feel like people, you know, the fire departments and their amazing research that they're doing are trying to come up with an answer. And then that fire season is just completely different. You know, 2020, there was dry lightning and then there were these wind events. And then there was, you know, there's, there's so many different ways that fires can happen. Um, um, yeah. yeah. The wind and PG &E. yeah. there's so many different things that, that lead to these big, events that you know until I don't I don't know if we'll ever get a full answer on that in all honesty because I think that everything is just ever changing right that's the world that we live in so all we can really do for ourselves is prepare ourselves so that's kind of where my focus ended up being like I read as much as I can um you know that there's national papers out there that kind of have forecasts for what they think fire season is going to be like um, I think they just released one last month that said they're hoping for a kind of more average fire season, which do we even know what that is? I don't know. <laughs> um, hopefully average means less, right? Like we don't want a big fire. Hopefully it's something that everyone can just jump on top of. But I mean, I live in an area that's pretty heavy with Cal Fire people, right? Like most of my neighbors are all involved in Cal Fire in some capacity. <laughs> So we talk a lot about that. Like they're all preparing just like we are in the veterinary world. Like they're preparing people in their houses. I'm preparing people in their animals. Um, and I think that's kind of all we can do with the, the world that we live in. And so what does that mean that you're preparing people or teaching people? Can you go into that? I'm going to stop my video because I see that I'm dragging. So <laughs> take it away. Yeah, no, definitely. 
Um, you know, I think some of the biggest things that we can do are just kind of know the risks that are in your area, right? So fire is definitely the biggest one that we think about. We we live in California, especially you in Spring, Shingle Springs, and I'm up in the Auburn area. Like fire is a very real risk for us. But for other people, there are other things like there are floods, there are earthquakes, there are prolonged power outages. Um, snow was a thing that we had to think about this year too, right? Like I... And, and what about heat, the excessive yeah. heat this year? Started yeah. early in June. Yeah, yeah. Um, so heat is very much a thing. So disaster isn't just fire, which I think is an important thing to think about if you're starting to kind of go along with, um, you know, different ways that you can start to prepare yourself. Um, so things that you can be doing, I think number one for if anybody takes anything away from this time that you and I have together, it's just go and educate yourself, right? Go and, and look at, there's some really amazing organizations out there that have some really wonderful preparedness um, information online. So the, like I said, the Northern California Association of Equine Practitioners, we have a whole page dedicated to different resources and different articles that you can be reading. Um, CVET, the other organization that I'm a part of, we're starting to really build all of the different areas that you can go to for preparedness. Um, so that's another website you can go to. Um, in terms of across the state, there's national disaster teams. Texas has a team. Florida has a really wonderful team that's really established and they all have resources for ways that you can educate yourself and prepare yourself. Um, so the different carts in your area are a thing to think about. Um, they're usually animal response team. So community animal response team is what CART stands for. And they will have a lot of really wonderful resources for you that are all local and they're all local people. So um, if you're in the Napa area, you have one of the most amazing ones and, and Butte County has an organization called NAVJAG, which is the Northern, oh gosh, Northern Area of Valley Disaster Group. No, yeah, Disaster Group. I always get it wrong, but NAVJAG. <laughs> Um, they're really wonderful as well and have a lot of different resources. So educate yourself on what's in the area. Um, and then kind of depending on what your risks are, you can start planning from there. So as an example, I'm in a fire area, right? So as soon as that heat wave started to come, it was like, okay, well, fires are definitely going to be a, a possibility right now. And it's something that I need to start preparing for. So I packed some go bags for all of my animals and myself. Um, I made sure Wait, I have it. Stop. What is in those? <laughs> Talk to me about them because I do not have to go bags. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Um, so for my, my dogs, I have enough food for about five days, um, just in case they had to be in a shelter, right? Um, that way they could kind of transition onto whatever food the shelter had. So I have enough food in there for about five days. I have um, these little sheets that I made that have um, their information, like their microchip information, their, um, their coloring and all the different markings that they have, and then a picture of me with them. So if by some reason we got separated, I wouldn't have to be like, no, this is my dog. <laughs> like, trust me, he's mine. Like, this is the love of my life over here. So um, I have a picture of me with him. And then it's all on this sheet, all the, his feeding instructions, his medications, um, anything that kind of pertains to him. Oh gosh. Can you guys not play right there? <laughs> um, and then some toys for this one, right? Just things that she loves. Um, a little first aid kit that has a couple of things in there, um, just some basic bandaging and, and some probiotics for if they get stressed, right? Um, and I think that's most of what's in their bag. And similarly for my chickens, I have the same thing. Um, for my horse, I have a similar one. I've got some banamine for her. I've got, um, you know, rat supplies and, and horse is the biggest thing that you're going to worry about is colic, right? It's colic in the shelter. If they're having a stressful event or a stressful um, feed change. Wait, can you guys not yeah. play? <laughs> I think everybody's animals suddenly like amp up when people are on Zoom. They're like, yes, let's steal the show. I swear. So well, this one back here lost a toy under there. So he might, I might have to pause for a second and go get the toy. It's going to be really fun. <laughs> 
Um, can you um, hear me okay? I think, like the, yeah. Uh, no, okay. you're good. <laughs> we hear you. We hear you really well. Despite um, the background noise. <laughs> um, so yeah, those are those are in my go bags. And then I have a, a go bag for my husband and myself too. He's a pilot, so he's gone a lot. So I kind of have to plan for okay, if something happens and it's just me, what am I going to do? So I have, um, you know, all of our titles, our marriage certificate, our mortgage, all kind of in a bag that's ready to go, things that I wouldn't want to burn. Um, and then just a couple of important little trinkets. So things like that, any medications that that we're both on, some Advil. <laughs> um, <Yeah>, Advil. <laughs> like alcohol you know, and drugs <laughs> evacuating I'm gonna have some Advil with me so it's gonna be <laughs> a thing um and then carriers for everybody right so I have a chicken carrier I have my cat carrier and, and all of that's kind of in one room that's upstairs and close to my exit so um a lot where's of your time. exit I have my exits up. So we have a two layer house. Um, and luckily the garage is in the downstairs, but there's also a front room exit. So you can like walk straight out in the front too. It's up on a hill. So I have it all in my upstairs. Like we just call it the third bedroom. That's kind of the abyss and, uh, <laughs> it's nice and easy to get out. And so I just have to pack everybody up and go. So I'd say I could probably evacuate within about 15, 20 minutes, pretty, pretty quickly. Um, have you, do you practice that Brianna? I actually don't, but I should. Um, oh, I, I should too. I, I mean, should, like that's I been should. in my mind. Yeah. yeah. Is, I, you would know more than I would, but I know during, I think the paradise fire, people actually burned up in their cars because they were back up and yeah. everything was stopped and the fire caught up to them. And that's, that's like the most horrifying thing you could ever think of so my rule of thumb is evacuate early yeah, <laughs> you know absolutely. like don't don't waste time why why get yourself in that position absolutely you're, you're spot on right like evacuate on the warning do not wait until the mandate right if and then there's um there's a really wonderful thing if you go to I should send you the link to the Northern California Association of Equine Practitioners it's NCAEP if you start hearing me say that because it's a lot shorter um they have a whole red flag day routine that was developed by Dr. Sonder of Napa Cart. And it's, it's lovely. It's just like getting all of, if there's a red flag day, right. Which usually the weather service will put out if it's kind of a high fire danger day. Um, and all of this you can find on Facebook. If you just follow the like weather station at Facebook or whatever, um, wherever your national weather service is, they usually have little areas that are broken down. So you'll see if you're in a red flag warning that day and she calls it the red flag warning routine. So it's more geared toward horses, but you can absolutely do this for small animals as well. Um, that is the day that you go fuel up your truck, you hook up your trailer, you put it in the right area. And then within, an, you know, within the next couple of hours, you load up your horse and you can just go sit somewhere. Just go sit somewhere for an hour, go sit at the target parking lot, go, you know, do something and that way your horse just loaded and left and sat somewhere and then hopefully you can just come home if it seems okay but then everything is already packed up and ready to go so if that evening you had to evacuate you have everything ready and you just load up your horse and you pull out um so, so smart mm -hmm. so smart yeah, yeah. Uh, any so for me any sign of issues I'm hooking up you yeah. know, I yeah. haven't practiced, I haven't gone through it. I have it in my head, but that's not good enough. Yeah. It's all things that we can absolutely be doing now. Right. So, um, there are things too, like that people don't think about having ID on your horse. So if you have to go to one of these shelters, um, making sure that you have some type of identification on them, because there's a lovely process to get in. Right. And these, local organizations are getting really amazing and sophisticated and a little too practiced at this, right? Because this is <laughs> just the way that it is right now, but there are some absolutely amazing volunteers out there and they will do their best to get everything on your horse and get identification on them as well. But it's it's good if you just kind of go in with your own thing. Um, and that way it's, it's easier for them at the shelter. And it's easier for me as a veterinarian taking care of your animal at the shelter too, if I know, hey, this thing needs pergolide. Or, hey, this thing needs, you know, is likes to colic when it's stressed. I need to do an extra colic watch on this one. Um, things like that. 
So I love the fact that you said, take a photo with you in it, with your animal. Yeah. Because I also worked a little bit of the campfire and it was a little bit of mayhem. Like it was amazing to see all the sheep. What I was so impressed with was the great Pyrenees dogs that saved sheep's lives and that they brought them to a safe place and then people found them and loaded them. I mean, I was just totally blown away by that, but a lot of the herds were minimal. Like mm -hmm. not everybody followed on those sheep, which was tragic, but the horses, nobody knew whose horse was what. And anybody could have walked in and said, that's my horse and just lied about it. And if there wasn't, well, everything, I, I saw people go, well, everything was burned up. I have no, no photos. Well, you could always, if you have yourself, mm -hmm. have a photo of you and your horse and your cell phone. Mm -hmm. So it got a little sketchy about claiming animals and stealing animals. And so I think that's a, a great, great advice. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for that. Debbie's saying <laughs> the, the thing that she's been wondering about is feeding in an emergency. They eat raw, but that's not practical to get out fast mm -hmm. with, with them. Any ideas? I would, I would keep a bag of dehydrated. If mm -hmm. your dogs are raw based and, and you, you're in a sketchy situation, have a couple like five days of dehydrated food. That's as close to your raw as possible. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's good advice too. Um, dehydrated would definitely be the thing or something that you could transition them slowly. So make sure, um, Purina makes a really great Fortiflora. I don't know if you're aware of that one, but it's a really good probiotic. So maybe yeah. like invest in a box of those on Amazon and make sure that you have some things just in case, you know, the diet changes too much for them. Um, Cause most likely you're gonna have to have a diet change. But also if you plan ahead, and you can evacuate to a place that's not a shelter, right? So my plan is to go straight to my parents' house. They're probably not going to be in a fire in the Central Valley. <laughs> so I am pretty sure I could evacuate safely down to them. So if you have a place to go to, a friend or family or things like that, and just warn them, hey, my dog's raw. Like when I get there, I'm probably going to need to go to the store and, and get stuff for them or things like that. So um, that might be something more that you think about too, is more your evacuation plan. And if your lifestyle isn't one that's going to be conducive to a shelter, then that's something that you're going to have to think about as well. Yeah, that's absolutely smart. I'm near Rancho Marietta Equine yeah. Complex. So that would be my go-to mm -hmm. place for my horses, but I have a two horse trailer and three horses. Yeah. So that's always in the back of my head is what am I going to do? And I kind of, you know, I hate to say it, but the old one would stay. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, have to that way or, um, your, I think in your area, animal control does a lot of the evacs too. So make sure that you know the phone numbers to call if you have to evacuate. Right. So this is where the education part comes in. Know your local entity that does evacuation teams. Cause you can always call them and say, Hey, I have two horses I'm taking out now. I have one left behind. Can you please go get him? Um, leave the one that's, you know, easy to load. <laughs> or make sure you have loading practice with them. Um, or make sure you have, you know, some people have a, <laughs> I know one lady, I was actually doing a talk at Horse Expo and um, she was telling me that during fire season, she lets her friends all keep their trailers at her house. <laughs> so she has extra horse trailers because um, she has an extra truck. And so she, so like my husband can drive that truck and trailer and then I can take all of my horses out. So she's like, I'm also trailer storage during fire season. So I have more trailers. <laughs> That's really smart. Um, I, I learned that people actually write the phone numbers, their phone numbers on the horse's hooves or on like some sort of marker, something yeah. like that. So what do you guess? My advice for that are these lovely, oh, I have it in my car. I should have brought it up. Um, cattle tags. They're like plastic cattle tags. That you can like rubber band onto their halter, rubber band into their mane. Um, like just do a quick braid and rubber band it in there. And then that has all of your information on it. And then that is one way of marking them, right? The other way is microchip your animal. Like horses, they have microchips for them as well. Um, so that way you have two forms of identification for them should they get lost. 
Um, but the cattle tags are my favorite. People do lots of different ways. There's like the cattle markers and all of these different ways you can write your phone number on the animal. Um, but a lot of the times they'll get sweaty and that will like come off. So um, have multiple ways. Give me one second. I'm going to get the dog. <laughs> the squeaking. <laughs> All right, you guys, thank you for your questions. This is really great wisdom. I'm seriously not prepared. <laughs> so I shouldn't even laugh about that. I'm laughing because I'm nervous over it. I'm not laughing because it's funny. And so, and it's, we're talking about fires right now. We'll talk about some other things. Fires are a really real threat in California. If you are in California We've had some massive fires the last four or five years, but so far so good. Okay, all right. Crisis averted, and this really intelligent border collie is now playing in the same exact spot he left his ball. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so because of the hot and yes. the wind, and so California, have you had many fires? this year it seems like a pretty quiet year so far knock on wood so far we have not been deployed um our organization is one that comes in if the local entities get overwhelmed and need help and support right and we provide veterinary support all of this information can be found at our website as well um so so far we have not been deployed <laughs> But that being said, you know, I have another go bag packed of just my clothes ready to deploy um, and a whole, <laughs> my family is amazing and they all have my animals figured out. If I get deployed, my husband's not home, my sister's coming to get the dogs and then my mom, it's like, it's all planned and ready because <laughs> this is That's so smart. Planet. That's so yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Debbie's saying she already looked up and saved the animal response team by county. And so she's already got that research in oh, that really? for her. Good job, Debbie. Ah, so proud of you. Awesome. And then Christy on Facebook is saying she has electrolytes in the trailer. Mm -hmm. When they were evacuated, they had to close all the windows and vents in the trailer. Traffic gets uh, traffic to get out. The horses were super sweaty. Mm, um, yeah. And then you may want to spray them down. Yeah, I mean, if you have time, right? Like it's all, it all ends up being a matter of time and you kind of do what you can. And that's why I hope you find some peace in knowing that like there are people like me out there that are gonna hopefully be there to help receive your animals. Um, and there's a really amazing organization, like all of our veterinarians in our organization are phenomenal and, and we all just want to be there for you on your worst day. Um, so you know, whatever you can grab, whatever you can do to prepare early will just make you feel better on the day of, but it's not going to be perfect. It, it can't be perfect, right? You don't really know what's coming. All you can do is, is plan and educate yourself and get things together that you can. Um, but I mean, every, I, I'm not really lucky on, I was, was the main veterinarian for the mosquito fire up here, um, in the large animal clinic. And they were, really there was a couple that came in that needed me for sure and one that I had dang IV fluids on and and was able to get him comfortable and I babied that guy for two weeks he did great in the end he went home um and he did awesome but uh you know they all got soupy mashes a lot and a lot of probiotics and a lot of electrolytes and and we baby them quite a lot so awesome the the horses that just get turned out or the animals that they just open the fences like cattle farmers and sheep farmers and some of those animals get burned pretty severely do you guys go out into the fire looking for them or do you wait till they come to an area yeah if that's a need that that county needs right that it all depends on the county um then by all means we have the capacity to do that as well um and you're right like you never know exactly what you're going to come across there so it's a little bit of a a catch bag of, of we're just ready for anything but most of the time it's a, a dehydrated sometimes injured animal um and we need to just get them out and get them to a hospital as quickly as possible so those are ones that don't usually go to the shelter they'll go to a hospital nearby and, and get further care 
Right. And then what other emergencies that you guys feel like are pretty serious other than fire? I mean, like fire can happen fast. I think a lot of people that get interviewed, people are like, oh, we thought it was pretty far away. And then all of a sudden we were evacuating. So um, fire can overtake you in a, in a pretty rapid way. And I remember I worked, um, I tried to help pick up horses in Southern California during a fire. And I had an aluminum horse trailer and it was so hot, everything was melting. Mm. And so I got turned around, which I was totally fine with because if the tires were going to melt, if the trailer tra trailer was going to melt, I could not believe the heat on that. Yeah. 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 No, those are all very real things, right? Um, and we just kind of do what we can with what we have. Um, but these are all things to think about and, and sharing the experiences, I think you know, platforms like this, where we can all just kind of talk about all the different experiences that we've had are ways that we're just going to further our education, right? And further what we're planning for. So things like if you have the aluminum trailer, maybe that's the one that you leave behind, or maybe you think about if you're in a high fire danger zone, like what is your material that your trailer is made out of? Um, but I think other disasters that we all need to be thinking about, my soapbox is always earthquakes, like it's going to happen. You know, <laughs> something is going to happen. It's going to be a bad one. It's going to be a, a probably highly populated area. So that one's going to probably affect a lot of small animals. Um, and I think that's something that we all need to be thinking of and, and planning for. Um, and then floods. I mean, that was a pretty real thing where my parents were this year. Like my mom and I were actually talking about evacuation for the first time. Um, and she's in the Central Valley where we thought she was probably the safest down there, but this winter really got close to her. So wow. yeah, floods are- earthquake. Okay, talk to us about earthquake preparedness. This is probably more California and what? What other states, Washington, Oregon? It can happen, right? It's, it's a thing. So, um, you know, finding a spot in your house where you all can be safe. I know growing up, it was what, like the bathtub and door jams um, seemed to be the places we were supposed to go. It's so funny. Like, I feel like none of us even think about earthquakes anymore, but gosh, it's going to happen. Um, and just again, being ready to safely get your animals out when it's safe to do so and get to a place that's safer. A lot of the same principles apply. Um, having your go bags ready and having your medication, everything in one place. So when it is safe to move, then you can, and you can move quickly. So I think at this point, that's probably the best that we can be doing is just kind of getting everything together in one room, keep it all close so that you can just be ready to pack up and go or, or move yourself and your family to the next lupus location. Dr. Brianna, I have been in quite a few earthquakes. I'm from Southern California. Yeah. I don't know about you. Have you been in a lot of earthquakes or a few? I haven't been in that many. Hold on. Now my dog has a squeaky ball. So I can tell you, I can talk to you about some pretty sketchy earthquake situations. Um, the fun thing about modern earthquakes, as opposed to the 1970s and 80s, is car alarms. So car alarms, if you're living in a city type area, you'll hear multiple car alarms start going off. And so you'll hear one, and then you'll hear two, and then by the third one, you bet I am out the door. And so... I don't know about hiding under the desk anymore or the door jam, but <laughs> car alarms are an awesome way to alert local community that you have an earthquake coming. And so I was actually in the Northridge quake. I lived in Northridge a month before and I kept complaining. I was uh, had a boyfriend at the time and I kept telling him, I hate Northridge. I hate Northridge so much. And so I moved out to Thousand Oaks and heard the car alarms going off, ran out. My phone rings and some girlfriend from Texas is calling me during the earthquake going, are you okay? Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm like, what? This is happening right now. Like, how did you know it? And, and they all thought I still lived in Northridge, which that building was destroyed. So it was over a parking structure and the whole thing collapsed and we were on the bottom floor oh. and um, all my mail came back from that place. This residence no longer exists. So 
crazy, right? Crazy. Crazy. So anytime I hear three car alarms, I was at a restaurant in Arizona <laughs> and I heard three car alarms get, go off and I was out the door. My friends are like, where are you going? I'm like, it's an earthquake. It wasn't. It wasn't. <laughs> it's a weird thing. But it's, it's a, a good thing that yeah. car alarms set off from earthquakes. Yeah. That is really good to know. Cause here, like I'm always on my soapbox. I'm like, it's going to happen. I don't know exactly what we're going to do when it happens, but it's going to happen because nobody really knows, right? Like we haven't knock on wood had like a big one that we've had to care for animals in these shelters yet, but the so, car alarms are awesome. I was, a horse tra- I was a horse trainer during the Northridge quake. One of our, one of my training horses actually foundered from it. Like it upset him so much. I was um, training out of Moore Park, California, big MD aluminum barn, really high roof. Sucker bent over and almost touched the ground. It was this rolling earthquake. Like somebody took a sheet and snapped it and everything just went like this. Like the aftershock, I literally had a horse tied to the tie rail on the outside of the barn, the barn almost hit him in the face, came back and you could see all the pastures going like this and all the fences rolling out. And that was an aftershock. That was like a, like a four or five point aftershock. And it was still like, like my client's horse died from that because he found her and he was so upset. Yeah. Oh man. So what, and the animals all seem to know it's coming. Like it gets crazy quiet. You don't hear a bird. You don't hear a cricket. You don't hear the dogs. You don't hear the cat. Like yeah. there's some bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you do with your dogs? With my dogs, if there's like a disaster or. An earthquake seems to jerk them around. Like that uh-huh. makes it senseless. Like there's. I was my first, earthquake. <laughs> my first earthquake, I think I was 10 years old. I climbed to the bottom of the bed, latched on. My two sisters had to pull me off. One had my hands, one had my legs, and they ran me down the stairs. But I thought it was the end of the world. I really thought yeah. I was going to die that day. And all of us, it was the end of the world in my mind. Yeah. yeah. I think you just got to grab everything and go, right? Because you're right. Like everything goes into this weird state of like something is happening. And you, I remember, what was it? There was one event that happened that like, I looked down at my, I looked down at my dog (laughs) and like, he just wasn't, he was just looking really weird. And then all of a sudden, like something happened. Um, But they are, they're so intuitive that they know everything that's going on before we do. Right. So that's when you just listen to your animals. If something's weird, just maybe that's when you just make sure you got all your stuff gathered and in the car. (laughs) Yeah. Do you keep stuff in your car ready to go to? I have some things in my car, mostly like my veterinary supplies, if I had to do something, but, um, there are, I do have like a little pack of food in there just in case, like if it was the worst case scenario, at least have some food for them. Um, and like some water and a water bucket. So just the basics. So, yeah. yeah. And it's such a disorienting situation, you know, like your dishes are cracking and crashing, the the windows are rolling, like it's yeah. so over sensory yeah. when it hits. And it's so fast. I mean, like most earthquakes are like 30 seconds or less. Yeah. So by the time you actually act, you yeah. could it's over usually. I know. Yeah. It's a tough call. The, the closest one I've been in, or the most recent one I was in, is actually the Napa quake. When was that? Like 2000. When did I start that school? 2018. So maybe 2017. Was that when the Napa quake was? I think I was so. Working in ICU at the vet school, and I was in the livestock barn. Like it was my rotation through the livestock barn as an ICU technician. And uh, I got really nauseous. Like that was my first inclination. Then I looked up. Like motion sickness. Yeah. Yeah. All the stethoscopes were swinging. And I think all, I mean, in that moment, all we could do was kind of wait it out and then go assess everybody after that. Um, Luckily, we're in an area where the earthquakes don't usually shake the places down. (laughs) Right. Well, I mean, uh, 
it's interesting because like Oklahoma and Texas, because of all the fracking, I think they are having way more earthquakes now. Yeah. yeah. Debbie's saying since it's earthquake weather here in Southern California, we've been parking our cars out of the garage. Oh, interesting. And, yeah. So wow. that is a thing. People think I'm it's earthquake. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes, people definitely think it's earthquake weather when it gets really hot and just kind of quiet. So I don't know if it's real or not. Oh, Gina, Gina, Janai, hello, welcome. And we're talking about earthquakes today and fires. So <laughs> it's also a SoCal person. And Kathy Lombardo is also. So we've got a lot of SoCalers on the Facebook Live today. You guys are having a little fires pop up. I don't know. Okay. If you take one thing away from this podcast or this, you know, conversation, do you have watch duty? I it, do not. Okay. <laughs> I used to have like next door neighbor or something like that. But no, tell me, tell us about watch duty. This, this is the app I am telling you. So um, it's real time. You can get notifications. It tells you every little teeny tiny fire that pops up in your area. So, I mean, just where I am. Oh, apparently there was one not too far from me. So I don't know. If oh, see oh, that. Today was that uh -huh. today? Oh yeah, my I gosh! Was the one that's been cool, but those are all the little ones that have been around me, right? So the one that was really close was in cool. It was only two acres. They stopped it. So as soon as those pop up, they start notifying you about them. Um, and you can be kind of at the forefront. So there was one that was by my horse not that long ago and I was watching it and, you know, it got to two acres and then it got to three acres and I was like, okay. So I started packing up my car <laughs> to go get her. Um, and then by the time I started driving to get her, then it was out. So it was all good. Um, good. yeah, that app is, is phenomenal. And they, I think they just expanded to, um, like Arizona and Colorado and Oregon. So they're kind of hitting more of the Western states, which is great. Um, but yeah. Well, what about, what about our East coasters? What can they grab for detection? And Good morning. question. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Um, University of Florida, I think, has some really great resources. They have an emergency team down there. So that's probably where I would start if I was in your situation. I didn't know what was going on on the East Coast. Um, the veterinary schools have really good information. So if you have a team like that, then they're going to have some really good things for you. Um, but I mean, just Googling, you know, there's, there's big, the National um, Veterinary Disaster Team has um, things as well. So all of these, all of these resources can be useful to you and can at least start pointing you in the directions that you need to go. Dr. Brianna, have you ever had to airlift an animal out? <laughs> I have not. Um, <laughs> I, I have not. I have trained. So I've trained with Butte County um, and the NAVDAG team a couple of times and, and they're phenomenal. I just trained with El Dorado not too long ago on some technical rescue stuff and airlifting. So knock on wood I have not I hope I never need to um, I hope not either we did um I didn't help but I kind of watched from afar a horse that rolled off the trail with the rider and the horse was stuck the rider was actually fine and they had to airlift it out of like Burbank area yeah it's it's a real threat too right if you're on the trails then have a little bag of emergency stuff ready with you too. Like when I ride, I usually have some banamine in my bag <laughs> and some <laughs> mash and like just some stuff in case you get stranded out there, right? You never know what a mountain's going to do or what a trail's going to do or what's going to happen to your horse on the trail. So again, everything is all about education and being prepared. <laughs> right. Um, and I noticed with the, the recent fires, the wildlife comes closer and closer into town. So we had a bear in our yard, um, a wild bear and a mountain lion. Mountain lion killed the local uh, next door neighbor's goats and things like that. So they just, all of a sudden, it's all these new things I've never really had to think about. I've never dealt with a bear in my yard before, and I don't really want to ever again. So what do you do in weird situations like that? I don't even own a gun. No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I should. 
I'll tell you my experience because that's all I have to go off of, right? But we just moved up here. We've been up here for about a year and some change now. And we moved in and my lovely neighbors who I absolutely adore were like, yeah, we have a neighborhood bear that goes through every Sunday on trash day (laughs) and goes and knocks over all the trash cans. And I was like, oh my gosh, all my dogs are going to die. Like my cat's going to die. It's going to be horrible. And uh, my husband, I love him so much. He's so wonderful. He went and installed like bear spray at like all of the major (laughs) exits um, and all of the... So he, we have bear spray kind of positioned all over our property, um, just in case, you know, we encountered when we have something close by that we can grab. Um, and then again, just kind of educating yourself on things you can do. So um, if you encounter an animal like that, you know, mountain lions, I think you're supposed to be still and not run and bears. I think you're supposed to make all these noises, right? So knowing what- No, I don't know. Like they just all- <laughs> I I think you're supposed to play dead in front of a bear, but I don't know if I yeah, could play I, dead. You, you know, know the, bear that, the bear that was in our yard tore up our neighbor's like trash and this whole uh-huh. separate building. There was claw marks everywhere. It was ripping trees up in my yard. Like it wasn't like the friendly neighborhood <laughs> trash seeking bear. Yeah. yeah. Stay inside so, if it's dusk and when every, all these things are kind of more active, right? Just stay inside. <laughs> the, the bear spray, um, do you carry that when you ride? I haven't because the places that I've been riding aren't very bear infested. Um, like it's mostly in town because my horse is getting used to the mountain life because she's a flatlander. <laughs> um, a so stressful for, for a city there. horse. Yeah. yeah. Um, when the deer like jump into their paddock and they're like what the heck yeah we got coyote on one trail and she was like that is not a dog mom what is that (laughs) it's like it's fine just keep moving (laughs) you're bigger than it it's fine um but yeah so we have I do not right now but I think that's definitely something to consider um would be bear spray or something like that and then having to think about too the consequences of that This, this is how my brain works so you're watching my brain in real time now is if you have bear spray, you need to probably train your horse to deploy that bear spray, right? Because if you do something new on their back, they're going to shy. And then are you going to go over a cliff? So Yeah, true, true. And um, Gina Janai saying pine sole and trash cans is supposed to keep bears and other animals out of the trash can. They don't like smell, but it's also toxic to animals. So that might be another diversion. And Christy says Riverside County definitely has bears um, and or rears Riverside emergency animal rescue system. They can be contacted to help evacuate for fires. Good. Good job, guys, that you're looking this all up and all your local. I want you to just educate yourself because I can sit here and talk all day, but everything is so specific for your county, right? Like there's amazing resources all around you that you just have to reach out and know that they're there. So one more question about the bear spray. How (laughs) did your husband put it up around your property? Like, are they like fly spray? You know how the fly, the automatic fly spray, you know, the, like the portable ones, or do they have to hit it? Explain it. He like mounted them in like a little holster. So you just like grab it and then shoot. Oh, yeah. Okay, so it's not something <laughs> that sees a bear coming and no, the bear no. grabs it. <laughs> you still okay. have to like, actually <laughs> spray the bear, but at least they're close by that you can just grab it and go. <laughs> I'm super not okay with that. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, if you have to, you have to, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's just kind of to protect yourself. And I mean, ours is more close to the house, right? There's been a couple of times where he saw the bear like on our property, but well, come dusk and dawn, like we don't go outside because that's that's their time. That's that's them doing their thing, and and you know they can do their nature thing, and we'll stay inside. And then come daytime, we'll go outside. <laughs> oh so, yeah. Okay. What other emergencies have you encountered in your whole emergency responding career? Oh goodness gracious! Good question. It's been. I mean, it's been ninety nine percent of fires, right? Um, I've done, especially as a practitioner, a few like technical response things. So working with the fire department or search and rescues, um, on down horses and things like that has been become a pretty big passion of mine. Um, 
And those are most of what I encounter up here. We were on call for the flooding, um, but didn't have to get deployed because everybody did great at evacuating and, and taking care of their animals. So that's that's how we want it, right? If the more people that are educated and prepared, the less you need me. And as much as I'm happy to be there for you in your time of need, I don't, you don't want to see me. <laughs> <laughs> and so, what about the snow? I mean, we had, I had, <laughs> I don't want that high in elevation and I had snow for like half a day, which was fine. I think it's beautiful for half a day, but it, yeah. there was people that were like six feet deep. Yeah, I think that's something, if that's a real threat in your area, then I had a couple of clients who actually had friends down lower that they would keep their horses with them. That's so smart. Um, so it's like they would move them out during the winter. Um, granted, this winter was kind of a crazier winter for everybody. It was just, there's so much snow. Um, like I was stuck in my house. I think the longest I was stuck here was like a day and a half. Um, but still, I mean, my neighbors were all like, we never get snow for more than a couple of hours, you know? So, um, making sure you have a generator, especially if you're on a well and you lose power or, um, making sure you have a water source for everybody is going to be really important. Um, and having a barn or some area that you can go in so your animals aren't just standing in the snow, cause that can get really irritating to their skin. Um, I think those are probably the two biggest things that I learned was just the generator, mostly because I needed my coffee in the morning. That was pretty <laughs> impressive. <laughs> the real, the real facts. You're like, oh my God, must have coffee. My oh poor my. husband, he left for a while and he was like, the generator's up top. You can have your coffee and then you should shut it off for a little bit. And I was like, okay. <laughs> That's smart. That's very smart. Um, and I have a little 50 pound English bulldog and he hates snow because he sinks. Mm. And so when he gets into snow, he's like, I'm out. I'm not, I'm not staying here because it's short legs, fat, dense body and no traction at all. Yeah. So he's miserable in yeah. the snow, you know, so that's not his jam. I was all excited. I'm like, Oh, we live near Tahoe. He's going to love this. And he's like, not no, getting out of the car. Not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not his jam. Um, the flooding. So we've seen some horrible, horrible pictures of horses being caught in floods and getting like this uh, mud fever or something like that. What do you do if you are involved in some pretty intense rain and flooding? I mean, the most important thing you can do is try to get to higher ground, right? Um, like getting them out of, because it's not just water in some of these floods, it's sewer material. It's, you know, it, you, you should not go into the water if you don't know what's down there. Cause there could be objects that could stab you there. There are lots of Power things. Lines. Exactly. So, I mean, as much as you want to get these animals out, you need to do it safely. So by boat, or ideally you will find these resources that you have now, and they will come and help you get your animals out, but they, it's really kind of a more of a time thing. So the longer they spend in these waters, the worse it's going to be. So just trying to get them out as soon as possible or having an area of higher ground that you know. Um, I know I have a friend in Colorado that was kind of like watching the water come up and you, a lot of the times you can see it, even if it's a flash flooding, like it's still going to come up and up and up and up. So just making sure you have areas to kind of move your animals to if you're in a high flood zone. Um, but I mean, the whole time the, the valley flooding was happening, I was talking to mom and I was like, this, you need to make sure you have a time to get out too. So if you have the luxury of it's moving a little slower, you're not going to regret evacuating for no reason. I know? think that is the key to everything is that's what I tell all my friends. I'm like, I'm evacuating at the first inkling because I don't want to be that person stuck in the car with my animals going, wow, I left too late. I would much rather be too early and not need it than too late and suffer some severe consequences. You're not going to regret evacuating for no reason. If you can go home in a couple of hours, amazing. You just had the best drill ever, <laughs> right? <laughs> You're really ready for the next one. So you really, you learn some things and everyone will be different. Um, but I think that is kind of the bottom line is you're not going to regret evacuating if you don't need to. 
Um, cause you're going to be, you know, what if it does happen and then you're already out, you're not dealing with the traffic, you're not dealing with all of these things and your horse is already tucked into the shelter, tucked into wherever your evacuation place is. So now what about the intense heat that, that a lot of our nation is suffering? Like these metal barns, they heat up. It's hard to get airflow through them. Sometimes half the time they're boarding facilities where you don't have much power over doing whatever you can do for your horse because they're like, well, this is how we do it. Your horse seems fine. Do you see horses or dogs and cats suffering for the intent from the intense heat? You know, like yes and no, right? Dogs and cats, I think, do have the luxury of air conditioning. <laughs> so they're a little a lot of the times with them, it's like don't leave your dog in the hot car. Don't put them on the hot pavement and have little burned toes. Um, those are kind of the things that you need to be thinking about for them a lot of the time. Don't leave them outside. If it's going to be 105, just bring them inside. Um, for horses, I know what I do for my own horse because she's at a boarding facility. So I do have to think about the boarding aspect of it as well. Um, I usually go out a couple of times a day when it's 105. She's a gray horse that's just dappling out. So she's mostly black. And I go, I go hose her off twice a day. And I give her, um, I... <laughs> what I call a sweet tea. My mom loves this. I get, um, literally half a handful of like LMF or senior or some like low carb feed that she thinks is amazing and put it in a bucket and then fill the rest up with water and a little bit of electrolytes. And I'll give her that twice a day. So it's Great. not really grain. So I'm not over graining her. It's literally a half a handful and she just thinks it's wonderful. Um, and we call it a sweet tea. So that's so sweet. I'll give her that twice a day and, and make sure she's hosed off. Um, but other things you can ask your boarding facility to do if it's safe for things like install misters um, can be a really nice thing to kind of keep the the temperature down. And um, but really, I think it just ends up being kind of spending some time with them a lot of the time, hose them off, make sure that they're drinking, um, make sure that they're hydrated and, and they'll be OK. Hopefully it's excellent. Okay. Yeah. I mean, horses in Arizona seem to do fine. I spend a lot of time in Arizona, but it's a dry heat and, and the weather's a lot more extreme here. You know, hundred we had what, 112, 114 in June. Yeah. Or ridiculous like that. It's like Las Vegas. But if the thing about Las Vegas is those animals are acclimating, their blood is thinning, whereas hair will have triple digits and then I'll drop down and then I'll be back up and it's just colic it's season. Colic season. <laughs> exactly. that's it exactly and really I mean if you think about it the root cause of colic and a lot of those is going to be that they're not taking in enough water and they're going to start having impactions it's not so much that their feet has changed it's usually a lack of water so that's where those sweet teas are. You can actually put Gatorade in water if they like flavored water that way. Having a couple of different water sources for them, making sure their water source is clean is a really big one. Um, making sure. What about smart water? Smart water. Yeah, like the regular smart water. Yeah. You know, with electrolytes and that's all that. Fine. Whatever. I always I mean, feel like. Yeah. Gatorade is so gross, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, whatever. I mean, it's, it's really just to encourage them to drink. Right. So whatever they think is great, like stick some molasses in there. If you have to, like, you just want to encourage them to be drinking. Like we'll do that a lot for horses in the hospital too. If they just don't seem to want to be drinking, they'll have like four or five different buckets with whatever the heck they want in there. Um, just to encourage them to be drinking. I'll even like sink some grass at the bottom of some of them and make them go bobbing for grass. That's great. Or cut a couple pieces of apple and mm -hmm. let them bob for apples, things like that. I love that. Maureen just said that Donkey Land had a fire and they were afraid they were going to have to evacuate 300 burrows. Um, but they were okay, I think. I hope so. That's terrifying. No, I hope they have a, a plan at least to get, I mean, that's, if you're at a boarding barn, I think that's another thing to think about is have a plan, talk with your boarding manager, talk with all of your different, all of your people at your boarding barn. This is what we do. We have a plan. We have a load list. Like I have my horse's neighbor is going to go in my trailer and we're going to go wherever <laughs> um, and write it down. I mean, even if you think that you have your plan, just writing down your plan and posting it somewhere so you're looking at it 
And if you're actually in that situation where it's time, having it written can be really helpful. Um, so you just grab that and, and start doing it. So, you know, communicating with your neighbors, communicating with the community, it really ends up being everyone has to come together to make these situations go smoothly. So, yeah, unfortunately, adversity is an opportunity for community. Hopefully, we can actually have more community before adversity. Yeah, yeah. So. I mean, this is this is the time, right? And I always said, like, I I have this job that I am absolutely in love with because I get to be there for people in their time of need. And I really work with people that have the biggest hearts. Like the people that come out in these times are some of the most amazing people you'll ever meet in your life. And we all just come together in these times. Um, and it makes me sad that I have a job where I can do this full time, <laughs> but also like how blessed am I that I get to, to do this, so. It is amazing. Well, thank you for your time. Do you have any other parting thoughts? And you guys, do you have any questions for Dr. Brianna? Yeah, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for having me. Thank you for letting me talk about what I love. And, and if anybody takes any little thing away from this, then I feel like I've done my job. <laughs> oh, I'm definitely, I'm definitely going to load that app. I did have a different app and it was a little slack since I moved up here. When I lived in Wilton, it was pretty awesome. But once I, I moved up here, I wasn't getting pinged or anything for some reason. And I have 5G up here. It's not like I'm super remote. I'm only, I'm only 15 miles from Folsom. I mean, like, I'm not like out back, yeah. you know? And so um, the app is a great thing. I've never used any of these resources. So I'm thrilled to know about all of this. Yeah, and I here, I'll put those acronyms I was saying in the chat as well. So N C A E P and C V A T, and then Kathy Blair is asking what good essential oils to put in the water for animals. You could probably, if they like essential oils, you want to make sure they like it. Is maybe just a little digestin or something peppermint like that. Probably great. Yeah, they probably like that little peppermint water. Yeah. Lavender, peppermint, lavender is pretty hardcore sedative. So if you need that in a case of an emergency, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you're the toxicologist, so can you mix essential oils and drugs? Oh, uh, I mean, I think in moderation, you can, everything is okay, right? But um, I would be hesitant to, especially if you're in a time of stress, that is kind of where your body does things that you're not used to. So even if there's research that says it's okay, like in a time of stress, your body chemistry really changes. So I would probably do one at a time. <laughs> That's <laughs> such good advice. Yeah, horses. I've actually, I've seen horses get sedated when they were already ramped up and it just went from bad to worse. You know, it just didn't even affect them and it made them a hot, sweaty, psychotic mess. So, so much wisdom on that. What about dogs like that too? It's same situation. Yeah. I mean, it's all the same. It, it's, you have one thing in your mind of what these animals are going to do. And then you put them in a situation like a disaster and everything goes out the window. Right. So just like us, we're all adrenalized and, and everything in, in your body is changing because there's different chemicals that are taking over. Um, so, you know, everything's a little more unpredictable. So just kind of grounding yourself again and moving forward one foot in front of the other and one thing at a time, I think is, kind of all you can do in a lot of these situations. Excellent. I I guess I should probably practice putting my cat in the cat carrier. <laughs> that, that's a big feat. That takes yeah. me more than 10 minutes. Yeah. So. You know, treats and food, if he's food motivated, just start feeding him in there. She could be. She's a barn cat. She comes in in the winter, you know, not like we had like 90 days of rain kind of, right? So she was over it. She started coming in every single night, but um, during the summer, she doesn't want to come in. So I'll have to work on that. Yeah, I love her. I would save her, but she's probably savvy enough. You know, I don't know. In the, the search and rescue that I did, we found more cats than anything because they're so scrappy and they fit into like a lot of them would just go into the culverts and then the fire would just pass over them and they'd come out and we'd get them and and take them into the shelters and 
like cats do kind of remarkably not well but like of all of the animals I feel like they had the higher survival rates just because they're so savvy um that makes me feel better Dr. Brianna because (laughs) I if I was gonna have to like catch my cat and take 10 minutes and that was gonna cost all of us some harm I I trust that she is pretty savvy yeah. Yeah. Make sure she's microchipped so that if I have to go find her, I can scan her and get her to you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Is she? I know she is, but I don't know where my paperwork is. Yeah, just I think it's all like an online registry now, too. So just make sure it's all under you and in there. You can probably just even, I think most places will scan her for free. So you can probably just take her in and say, hey, can you scan her so I can get my number? Okay. Um, That's super good. smart. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You guys, I hope this blessed you. It blessed me. I know I've got some homework to do. And Dr. Brianna, we just thank you so much for everything you're doing. You're out on the front line and you're probably risking your life a little bit too. So thank you for that. It's what I'm, what's what I'm here to do. I fully know that. So <laughs> grateful to yeah be oh Charlene says any specific suggestions on other than what's been mentioned for other scenarios like tornadoes oh tornadoes I live in California I don't have to worry about tornadoes I know well, it's like you weigh your odds like do you yeah. I know here yeah. we are talking about fires and the people in Ohio are like okay that's fun but <laughs> about tornadoes um I think it I really the bottom line for most of these things are go on the warnings I know you guys have really good warnings for tornadoes a lot of the times with your sirens and things like that so I think the principles still kind of apply of making sure you have your go bags packed and a place to evacuate too um you've had a couple in Southern California that's terrifying oh no <laughs> But I, I, I do had one. we had one in Lockford where it took down my fence, a little one. It yeah. touched down and wiped my backyard out. Yeah. I mean, hopefully your livestock will be able to be in an area where they can get away from it if you don't have the ability to evacuate. Um, but I think, you know, for us, we're supposed to what go into an underground shelter if possible, basements. Um, so maybe if you're in a tornado heavy area, all of your go stuff is kind of in the basement. Um or a place where you would go to to be safe for a second and then be able to get out. So um, just kind of thinking along those lines, I I apologize, I probably don't have the right specific (laughs) um, advice for you, but I think that some of these principles can apply pretty widely of making sure that you're ready to go quickly and then going before, before you hear the sirens. If you start getting a tornado warning day, maybe that's a day that you you know, pack up and go camping somewhere else. Um, that could be your horses because we don't get out of tornadoes very easily. I had a, I used to work in Oklahoma and Texas a lot and had a client whose barn was hit, killed the whole roof off like a tin, like a starting can. And, um, the horses were spread all over the place. The dog was picked up and dropped off like three miles away oh, wow. yeah I mean just scary scary stuff their horse trailer was in the tree mm. yeah. yeah like you you can't and there were California people that went from yeah. California to Oklahoma so I mean how do you get ready for moving your trailer so it's not in the tree you know yeah. I, I wouldn't even know what to do with that yeah I I, I do though I think the best advice I can give you is be ready to go and go early. That's kind of across the board, hurricanes, tornadoes, fires, earthquakes are a little bit harder because you don't really know when they're coming, but. And they're short, like short. So those are probably the most challenging ones to prepare for. Um, But I think still, if you kind of have your stuff more centralized for these, these times, like i I don't know if I'll actually undo my go room in all honesty, because the snow was so bad this year. Like I'd like to have all of my stuff ready to go. If I did have the opportunity to go before a big snowstorm. Um, so just kind of having your important things together and have enough food and water for everybody for, you know, a couple of days in case you get stranded somewhere. Um, so I guess the aftermath on the earthquakes would be, um, leaks, gas leaks and power outages. Yeah. And so so food and water, you know, making sure everybody has food, water and medications. Um, the biggest things you can do and identification. So 
making sure you have those identifying ways of, of being reunited with your animal should um, all of your planning, you know, you plan and plan and plan, but until it happens, you don't know if you're actually ready. So. Um. So we should probably, if we have horses, keep all that stuff in the horse trailer. In the trailer or with you, make copies, have one in the horse trailer, have one with you. Right. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have yeah. Multiple. Just in case you do have to turn them loose or whatever might happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. God forbid. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Oh, I have <laughs> work to do. <laughs> But better now than, than <laughs> late. Yeah, obviously I'm not prepared. And so I think everybody is more prepared than they let on for. But I mean, even when I talk, every time I talk to somebody, I think of something new too, right? So there's still homework that I have to go do. I have to go make sure my cat has his microchip papers done. I was just thinking about that as I was doing this. I was like, oh man, I should probably make sure he's all together. And then I just got some new chickens. So I need to make sure they're all ready to go. So um yeah every it's always going to be something it's just an evolving situation and and you learn as you do more exercises like this right so how many so do you pack everything in one trailer like do you have a large trailer for my horse um for I, all of them for the chickens like do they all go <laughs> in the truck like how do you pack uh, them? I plan on putting them all in the truck for now. I have a bumper pull. So I think I would be able to fit everybody in one load. Um, chickens are probably going to go in the back and be unhappy with it, but I don't really know what else I can do. Dogs go in the cab with the cat and then, you know, swing by, load up the horse and go. So it'd right. probably be my plan right now. Um, and then everything is in that room. And then her trailer is always packed for her as well. So, um, yeah, that's, that's what I do. And then I have, you know, all these identification sheets for them, but hopefully I'd be able to just take them straight down to my parents' house and drop everybody off. My poor parents, they even have like a converted dog run that they're ready to take my chickens into. Should they need it? That's so sweet. Your mom's the best. She is the best. I know your dad a little bit, but not that much. Yeah, find, find somebody like my mom and then you'll be okay. I'll go to your mom's house too. Yeah, mom will take everybody. We'll be fine. <laughs> she will. She's just that kind of person. Well, hopefully you have like a course or something that people can just download and watch. And if you don't, maybe you should do that. I think about that. I mean, I just, I just started this position a couple of months ago. So we're still kind of figuring out everything of, of where I fit in. So um, great suggestion. And, and I think there are a lot of um, organizations out there that have some really amazing stuff already, but by all means, if you want my specific things, then you know where to find me. I'm not hard to find. <laughs> yeah. If you want to, if you want to do a Zoom call and record it and then run some Facebook ads to it, just so people can be prepared. I don't know. Davis would fund a little something like that, just so nobody gets hurt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, we're kind of in the training phase right now, like developing the different training. So it's it's something I can probably run up the ladder and see what they think about. So for sure. Fantastic. Good. I love that. I think it's really smart. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You guys have a great rest of the week. And Dr. Brianna, you stay out of fires. <laughs> <laughs> And if you hear three car alarms, book it. <laughs> no matter if you're in Arizona or Mexico, go. <laughs> yeah. Take care, you guys. Have a great week. Bye.